Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for the Gordon Lecture. The mission of the Kennedy School is to train leaders for service to society, and today's speaker is a shining example of a committed public servant, a man who has devoted his career to the American people and the public good. We're honored that Senator Dole has agreed to be with us today. He is a great American. It's also my, priv my privilege to introduce to you today and pay tribute to another great American, the founder, the man behind the Gordon Lecture, Albert H. Gordon, one of Harvard's most loyal and enduring supporters. Al Gordon is a local boy, born in Situate, a graduate Harvard College class of 1923. He uh, holds an MBA and an honorary LLD from the university, became a partner of Kidder Peabody in 1931, went on to act as chairman of Kidder Peabody, and uh, as one of America's most influential business leaders, has served on a number of new, uh, corporate boards and organizations. He's also served Harvard University in many capacities as a member of the Board of Overseers, a longtime member of the Committee on University Resources, and president of the Harvard Club of New York. When we describe Al Gordon as an active alumnus, we're guilty of understatement. His running career is legendary, including his noteworthy accomplishment of having run and finished the London Marathon in 1982 at the age of 81. <laughs> Mr. Gordon. <laughs> Mr. Gordon generously established this lectureship in 1985, and today we thank him again for bringing outstanding leaders to the Kennedy School of Government. Thank you, Al. <laughs> this is also a red leather day for the Kennedy School in the sense that uh, we're about to announce the establishment of a new pro no center for nonprofit uh, organizations, which has been sponsored by Rita and Gus Hauser, who we hope will, friends of Senator Doles, who we hope will be joining us shortly. Uh, but now, to introduce Senator Dole, I'd like to introduce Sheila Burke, the Executive Dean of the Kennedy School. Sheila is uniquely qualified to introduce Mr. Dole, having spent nearly 20 years on his staff before joining the Kennedy School last fall. She served as Senator Dole's Chief of Staff for 10 years and as Secretary of the United States Senate during Mr. Dole's tenure as the Majority Leader. We're proud that she is a graduate of the Kennedy School because she too illustrates the type of public service that we think is meritorious and which we try to train people for. So we're delighted that Sheila has returned to our alma mater and is here to introduce Senator Dole. Let me introduce our Executive Dean, Sheila Burke. Thank you, Joe. It is indeed an enormous pleasure for me to be here today and have this opportunity. Let me begin, if I might, uh, my introduction by reading to you a section from Senator Dole's book, Unlimited Partners. In this section, he describes an event that took place early in his career when he was asked to speak to a GOP committee dinner in Indiana. Uh, the local radio show announced the Dole visit in the following way. The guest at this evening's dinner, he said, will be Congressman Bob Doyle. He will speak at the American Legion Hall. Tickets have been slashed from $3 to $1. <laughs> a color television set will be given away. You must be present to win. And we're not going to draw until Congressman Doyle gets through talking. <clears throat> Doyle was born in Kansas, raised in Kansas, educated at the University of Kansas, and prior to World War II was a pre-medical student. He fought in Italy where he suffered a serious hand injury and went into politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, Senator, we've both come a long way <laughs> since 1961. On a most serious note, perhaps the most famous words of one of this institution's most famous graduates are these. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Today, it is my honor to introduce a man who, more than anyone else I know, has brought these eloquent words to life. 
Like many of his generation, including Jack Kennedy, Bob Dole risked his life for his country and for the cause of freedom during World War II. The wounds that Bob Dole received in the hills of Italy meant that he could not, in fact, fulfill his childhood ambition of being a physician. But during the four long years of hospitalization and four more years of rehabilitation and many years after that, Bob Dole never gave up. Instead, he asked himself what he could do for his country and began one of the century's most enduring political careers. From the Kansas State Legislature to the Russell County Attorney's Office to the United States House of Representatives to the United States Senate, Bob Dole served 44 years of his life for the public, leaving his mark on nearly every major piece of legislation of the last quarter century. He also left his mark on all of us who had the privilege of working for him. In the 19 years on his staff, I found him to be principled, to be just, to be forward thinking, to be a tough taskmaster, but a fair one. And unlike President John, well, <laughs> there were days. <clears throat> unlike President John Adams, who as you know was a graduate of this institution, and who wrote to his wife that he could not speak to her of politics because she was a woman, Bob Dole was one of the few leaders in the Senate in leading the effort to hire and promote women, of whom I am only one. He is known for having had the best sense of humor in Washington. I suspect you'll see some of that today. But I remember last year when Senator Simpson announced that he would be teaching here at Harvard, and Senator Dole indicated that, in fact, if he was elected president, he anticipated that one of his first acts would be sending a helicopter to rescue Simpson from Harvard Yard. <laughs> Fortunately, the call wasn't necessary. Simpson, in fact, has survived, as we can see. John Adams wrote another letter to his wife the day after he moved into the White House, which is somewhat less infamous than the one I noted earlier. But in that letter, he wrote, may none but honest and wise men rule under this roof. Harvard graduate Franklin Roosevelt had those words lettered in gold in the marble over the fireplace of the state dining room. And while Senator Dole will never serve under that particular roof, he did in serve, ser serve with distinction under many other roofs in his time, and he was, in fact, both honest and wise. So it is with a great deal of pride and pleasure that I introduce to you the man that I will always think of as the leader, Senator Bob Dole. Thank you very much. Dean Nye, thank you very much, and Sheila, thank you very much, and Mr. Gordon, thank you very much. When I read your bio on the way up, it says born 1901. I said there's been a typo, but you've indicated if you're still running at 81, you'll be ready for a plane jump. Uh, <laughs> and I'm glad that President Bush waited till after the election to bail out, but in any event, <laughs> uh, and I'm pleased to see so many upperclassmen here today as I look around. But, this is an exciting time to me. I haven't been uh, here for some time. What was it, 80? 88. 88. I, Peter, how are you doing? I remember 88. <laughs> and I'm pleased to be here. And somebody asked me if I didn't feel a little like, you know, Daniel venturing in the lion's den coming to Harvard. And I said, not really. I think some of my fellow Republicans have never forgotten that FDR went to school here. And then a few more got riled up because Jack Kennedy went to school here. And I remember when Bill Buckley declared that the country would be better governed by the first hundred names picked at random from the Cambridge phone book. <laughs> now, I don't feel offended because he said the same thing about the United States Senate. So neither Harvard or Washington have ever been notably self-effacing. And some, uh, since Elizabeth or Sheila's mentioned John Adams, uh, he said in 19, 1756, the class of 1756, he wrote to his brother or cousin Sam and said, Boston Town Meeting 
and our own Harvard College have put the universe in motion, end of quote. <laughs> now, apparently Adams was suffering from Potomac fever long before he ever reached the Potomac. But I feel pretty much at home here because I have some very strong ties here. I've already been indicated Sheila Burke, my former chief of staff who serves as executive dean here at the Kennedy School. My good friend Al Simpson, uh, who I've been watching on C-SPAN, having a ball up here, Marvin Cal, Mickey Edwards, Mag Phil Sharp, as I go around. A lot of people I've worked with. Jill Hansen, who was my former political director. Where's Jill? Right here. Is sharing her insights on how we almost won. Uh, <laughs> at the Institute of Politics as a fellow. And then there is my wife, Elizabeth a proud alumnus of the Harvard Law School and the School of Education. The Dole who may yet reside at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> so you have has-beens and... I've already been in touch with Dennis Thatcher in case that should happen. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Margaret Thatcher went to the Falkland Islands and forgot him, but in any event... <laughs> If that ever happened, I understand I get a car and a driver. What else could you ask for? <laughs> so, so the has-beens or might have beens and want to be, sooner or later they're all gonna end up at Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> So I'm very proud to be here, and I know this is a mixed group, one Republican. Oh, two of Peter's here. Uh, Peter, excuse me. I saw Joe there. Any of my friends here. <laughs> I also want to say a word about Albert Gordon because I did read about it, read about you and about all the great things you've done in your lifetime. But this forum recognizes a great man of business who made mankind itself his chief business. It's through his support and generosity that we have had the opportunity to hear from a number of international leaders in business and finance and in public service. And his efforts to improve the discussion and increase the understanding of matters related to public policy are certainly a great benefit to us all. So I want to thank you again, Albert, very much for being here. 96 was a good year for you, wasn't <laughs> too good for me, but... Uh, <laughs> so I want to just share some of my thoughts uh, with respect to public service. You know, I did everything during the election. I fell down during the election. <laughs> Clinton waited till afterwards. Like, you know, ev everything. We tried to get all of our, <laughs> all of our stuff. I said when I fell off that stage in Chico, California, on the way down, I got a call from the trial lawyer. You know, <laughs> you need a lawyer? But this is one of my first public appearances, I can say that honestly. I haven't been out a lot. I've been keeping quiet, which is difficult to do if you've ever been a United States Senator. But it's felt to me that, you know, I lost the election. And my obligation was to just sort of sit back or stand back and, and see what would happen and obviously speak out from time to time on public policy issues. So I haven't been in the public uh, light very much, unless you count the Letterman Show or Jay Leno or Saturday Night Live or Suddenly Susan, <laughs> which is my preference. <laughs> but I sort of thought about and if, if Fred Thompson can go from Hollywood to the Senate, I think I ought to be able to go from the Senate to Hollywood. <laughs> and I'm not certain there are any parts available, but who knows? They're the only paying jobs I've had since leaving the Senate. There's a union scale you must be paid. And every night they show Saturday Night Live again, I get another $1,300. So <laughs> if you would write in demand that they <laughs> add more. So. But I also wanted to prove a point, that there is life after politics. And there's life after losing an election. It is an end, but it's also a beginning. 
And I, it seemed to me that you have a couple of choices when you lose. You can go off in the corner and say life isn't fair or this wasn't fair, or you can get up and go do something else. And so I'm in the process of, of doing something else. Obviously, it hurts for a while because you put, you know, a couple of years of your lifetime into some of these projects, whether you're running for president or governor or state treasurer, whatever it might be. But the pain is sad by the people who have been out there supporting you and the people who love you. And then there's a stray voter or two who stops from time to time saying, I wish we could do it all over again. I made a mistake. Well, it won't happen all over again unless, well, unless Clinton should ask for a recount. <laughs> it, it, I'd be prepared, but... It's not going to happen all over again. So let's look to the future. That's what Harvard's all about. That's what this group's all about. And that's why I'm here today. Not long ago, I came across a book of predictions for 1997, written by the self-proclaimed top 100 psychics in America. And according to one psychic, my home out in Russell, Kansas, will be destroyed by a great tornado this year. Kind of puts last November in perspective. And of course, I've already notified the Red Cross to stay on alert. <laughs> but <laughs> So we've had 50 years pass since General George Marshall came to the yard to unveil the European recovery program that would bear his name. And greeting him that day was an educational statesman who stood on a plane with Marshall himself. Harvard's president, James Bryan Conant. And he had played a large role in World War II. In fact, in face of a lot of opposition, you've read all the history about that time, there was a lot of opposition to America in World War II and entering World War II. But he had been an outspoken advocate of American involvement well before Pearl Harbor. And later he contributed his scientific gifts to the Manhattan Project when he came home to Cambridge in the fall of 1945, he was more determined than ever to make Harvard reflect Jefferson's natural aristocracy of talent and virtue. Democracy is not only opportunity for the able, said Conant, it is equally betterment of the average. And in his office, he displayed a favorite cartoon with a caption I think it applies today as well as any other time. And he said, every the little cartoon said, behold the turtle. He only makes progress by sticking his neck out. And of course, sticking one's neck out is not very popular these days, and it's never been particularly popular in politics. Yet I'd remind you that America achieved greatness as a land of pioneers, not a land of poll takers. And I've always thought if they'd taken the poll, the Mayflower never would have left. Or been far off of some of the polls in 96, it never would have reached America. It'd probably been, I don't know where it ended up, tip of South America, I guess. And later generations of immigrants might never have set sail for Ellis Island. And no prairie schooner would have crossed the wide Missouri. And how many poll-driven politicians would have challenged the status quo, risking their careers to make us live up, however belatedly, to the promises we made to each other <clears throat> at the birth of the Republic. And Al Simpson had the courage to take on Medicare and Social Security, and he looked at the polls. So I believe the Kennedy School is to be congratulated for its interdisciplinary program called Visions of Governance for the 21st Century. Now, if you follow the press, you know I'm not supposed to be much of that so-called V word. I'm always read about lack of vision. And I always thought there was a lot of lack of vision in the press that my vision was okay. <laughs> They're the ones that didn't have any vision. But it sort of depends, like everything else, who defines vision? Who defines what vision is for America, or for your class, or for your family? It's all in the definition. I remember my first race for Congress way back in 1960. We had a power broker lived in Logan, Kansas. His name was Dane Hansen, very successful highway contractor. And about the only thing orthodox about Mr. Hansen was his view of economics. His schedule was decidedly unorthodox. I lived in Russell, and it was about 70 miles to Logan, Kansas. And he didn't start his little discussions or dialogue with politicians until about supper time. And they would go on and on hour after hour. And he would hold court 
with visiting politicians or businessmen, and their discussions would end sometime at dawn or maybe later all over this endless prairie of northwest Kansas. But I was lucky. It took only one visit and one night to establish my credibility with Mr. Hansen. Someone asked him later whether I was acceptable ideology. He had a simple answer. He said, well, I knew he was a fiscal conservative. He said, the tires on his car were threadbare. And I satisfied him. So my vision over the years, and I think it's been a vision, sometimes you get interrupted and sometimes you hit a barrier, was to expand beyond this so-called Hanson living room where all of us used to traipse in the younger days. And I believe in a government that is neither intrusive nor cold-hearted, one alive to its social responsibilities without trampling on the rights of society's most creative members. I voted for civil rights laws because I know that no first-class democracy can tolerate second-class citizens. And I spoke up for the disabled because if a mind is a terrible thing to waste, so is a spirit. And America can ill afford to sacrifice the skill or insights of any of any of its people. I have tried to raise the floor under Americans in need without lowering the ceiling on those whose ingenuity, ingenuity helps to create our jobs and advance economic justice. And I have tried in my lifetime in politics to reach out to people, not shut them out. Where I come from, inclusiveness is a sign of strength, not of weakness, and I think some in our party define that word in that way, and probably some in the other party, too. Now, some in the media suggest that not everyone in the Republican Party agrees on what it means to be a Republican. Well, I just say, well, welcome to America. I don't think anybody agrees on anything all the time, let alone 250 million people. I belong to a political party, not a cult. And in our diversity, in my view, is our strength. And we have diversity, as they have in the other party. And as Republicans, it's always been my hope, my view. Our only litmus test is liberty of conscience and the sanctity of the individual. Last year, for example, I didn't pick Jack Kemp to be my partner because he agreed with me on all my ideas. I asked him because he had ideas of his own. And some might be better than mine. As I look back on it, I should have picked Tiger Woods. but. <laughs> We'd have to up to his age a little bit. So I would guess in my case, standing here before this great audience, as I've spent most of my lifetime trying to bring people together, trying to distill single public interest out of many competing interests. And boy, there are a lot of them out there. I know my friend Trent Lott, who succeeded me as majority leader, is finding that it's not quite as easy when you're the leader. And I know that Tom Daschle could tell you the same, and, and certainly Newt Gingrich has learned it's not always easy to be the leader, and Dick Gephardt. But first of all, before you can lead, you have to listen. You have to listen. Sometimes you don't want to listen. I can see now members coming to my office, my colleagues want to give me a little advice on what to do as leader. And I didn't want to listen, but I did listen. And I hoped that I was a better leader for it. And I didn't think that was weakness. To me, that was leadership. If you don't listen, you may not pick up somebody's better idea. Now, Sheila had a lot of good ideas, but, and we accepted many of them. But we always listen to other people. And I said last year in San Diego in my acceptance speech that I was the most optimistic man in America. And many said, yeah, he must be if he thinks he's going to win. <laughs> but I said that <clears throat> with good reason. I know something about overcoming adversity. But it wasn't my personal story alone to which I was referring. In my lifetime, I've seen this country defeat economic depression, the scourge of Hitler, Soviet imperialism. I've seen us eliminate the deadly peril of polio, and the less insidious disease of Jim Crow. 
I've watched barrier after barrier fall as women, blacks, and the disabled were belatedly welcomed into the American mainstream. And I've seen the birth of the information age, and I've cheered as Americans left their footprints on the moon. And I don't mean to suggest that all these accomplishments overshadow continuing problems of poverty or injustice or, in some cases, insensitivity. In my view, America is a work in progress. If we solve today's problem, there will be another problem. But we're always working. We're always working harder. A land that has never become but is always in the act of becoming. It's a work in progress. And this is what John Adams said. And for all his Harvard pride grasped by instinct some two centuries ago, it is what members of the class of 2000 must realize and act upon. To them will fall the responsibility for cleaning up American politics. In our system, differences of opinion are certainly healthy. I've always thought the only thing that's fatal is indifference, when you didn't do anything or you didn't care. We talk about ignorance and apathy, and you all know the joke about ignorance and apathy. But that's what plagues us today, a creeping cynicism rooted in public dissatisfaction over campaigns that nearly resemble the McLaughlin group and an honest clash of ideas. Now, an election campaign is supposed to be a conversation we have with ourselves. But lately, as you know, if you look at the turnout in the last election, 96, millions of Americans just tuned off or, or tuned out of that conversation. And moreover, there seems to be an inverse relationship between the amount of money politicians raise and the amount of respect they enjoy from the electorate. Harry Truman had it right when he said the chief power of the modern presidency is a power to persuade. And that power is diminished and the bully pulpit cheapened when the church itself is turned over to the money changers. It is necessary to raise huge amounts of money. I hated it. I would never make a phone call. I would never make a phone call for myself. I would call for Al Simpson. But I've never called somebody It was demeaning. When I was a leader of the Senate to call somebody and say, would you send me $1,000? What a recourse did that person have at the other end of the line, particularly if they had something pending in the Congress of the United States? And it is necessary to raise a lot of money. We're told it's necessary to buy TV spots, but I don't know anybody remembers any of mine. I don't. <laughs> and to find one's opponent in the most unflattering light possible, it costs a lot of money to knock down your opponent. And as a result, it's much easier to demonize a rival than to discuss an issue. And I hope it changes. And I'm not talking about anybody, anyone in particular. I've been around in politics for a long time. I've been on both sides. I've been doing the kicking, and I've been getting kicked. But it does seem to me that it's more and more and more negative. I said to a, the smaller group, we went back, at least somebody did some surveys after the election. We thought we had a good economic package. Regulatory reform, balanced budget, tax cuts for families with children. 83% of the coverage of our economic package was negative. Now, if you're the voter out there and 83% of our package is negative, you're not going to be very excited about it. And then following the campaign, somebody always takes surveys, they determined that 67% of my network coverage on the nightly news was negative, 33% positive. President Clinton was just the reverse, 67% positive, 33% negative. And some polls showed us 20 points behind on election day. Now, I don't know how many people stayed home, but it wasn't very, didn't make us very enthusiastic. We lost by, what, seven and a half points. So I'm not certain of what the answer is. But I know that our campaigns are becoming sort of exercises in slick packaging. And I'm not somebody you can package that way. I'm not slick. I try to be honest, I try to be straightforward. And we have all these soaring phrases that are duly tested by focus groups. I remember going, I didn't go to Atlanta, maybe Jill did, did a little focus group, test out this word or this word, 
And then if it gets a home run, that's the word you use. And then you validate all this, of course, by pollsters. And all too often, it seems in my, that you substitute words for what you really want to talk about. You substitute words for deeds in modern American politics and result that both words and deeds are devalued. And maybe that's why, I don't know the total answer, Marvin might know, but I don't know the total answer why the American voter just turns it off. Maybe it's too long, maybe it's too much, too much television, too much this. So it seems to me that we've got to work it out for us there. We saw, I think, a new level of debate in 1996. I've always thought that I played a constructive role in preserving Medicare. In fact, my, one of my proudest, I guess, le legislative achievements was rescuing Social Security along with Al Simpson, but I worked closely with Pat Moynihan, a Democrat. And we sort of put it together with the help of other people, but it was about to go down the tube. And we said this should not be partisan, this should not, we've got to resolve this, we've got to meet one more time, and we met one more time, sooner or later we put it together. But I can tell you, when you frighten senior citizens, you also frighten their children, who suddenly think, I might have to pay the doctor bill. And so all these things are caught up in a campaign, it doesn't take a Harvard diploma to figure out that America or any other industrial nation for that matter, cannot survive economically if ever-growing entitlement programs leave no room to fund any other functions of government. And I said in the campaign honestly, and I say it today, I'm not, I'll never campaign again for myself. We need to address entitlements. Al Simpson, Senator Simpson, has been saying that at Harvard for the last two or three months. And if we don't do it, we're going to punish the very people who are now the beneficiaries. And we're obviously going to punish your generation. We can't get the job done with rhetoric. We've got to stop the posturing from either side. And I'm not certain about the current climate wars. I'm not here to judge or to criticize or to make any news. I'm just here because it's Tuesday. <laughs> but if we're going to make progress, we've got to make tough decisions. We can talk about the CPI and about another commission, another study. One area that I've always thought, if, if anything else, if you didn't have courage enough to do anything else, at least you ought to take a look at Part B Medicare, where if I'm a millionaire, I only pay 25% of the premium. The government pays the rest. So somebody down there is going to sweep up after we all leave, is contributing his or her taxes to pay for that millionaires Part B Medicare. We wanted to raise it to 50%. In fact, we did in our committee, but nobody would go along. We're only saying if you make a lot of money, you ought to pay a little more. And it made a lot of sense to me, but you start frightening people, and they think you're talking about them, because they don't consider themselves to have any substantial wealth. So I, I would just say in passing, if we're going to save Medicare, it better look a lot different than it does now, I'd say, in 10 years. It needs structural changes. We can't just tinker around the edges, transfer money from one fund into the other fund. We've tried all that. And the President said in his State of the Union address, the enemy of time is in action. And I think he was right. And I think it's time to do what's right for our nation's elderly, before the President's word become an epitaph for the Medicare program. I believe senior citizens are ready, particularly it's not an election year, if the leadership in the White House and the Congress, Republicans and Democrats, don't misunderstand me, all speak with one voice. It'll be done. And equally as critical to our long-term survival as an economic power, as well as our responsibilities to your generation, is this long sought agreement to balance the budget. And I won't get into that because your eyes sort of glaze over. You go through this period every year in Congress and you read about it. <clears throat> the is hopeful. Somebody else is not quite as hopeful. 
and probably none of them should be too hopeful, but it's going to be tough. They're talking about different numbers from so-called Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management Budget. It's a lot easier, though, this year to balance the budget if you're in Congress than it was uh, even a year ago. At least, according to one of these, CBO, I think, tells the Congressional Budget Office, about one-third easier. And yet, they're still struggling for common ground. I hope they find it. Because we need to sustain economic growth. I met a number of people who are majoring in economics uh, at lunch. And I think we can have some tax cuts. Many things we advocated in our economic plan, estate tax relief. If you watched the news last night, you watch this lady with her daughter having to sell off almost the entire farm to pay the, borrow money to pay the estate taxes. Everything's already been taxed at least once. There has to be some relief for small farmers, small businessmen and women in that area. Regulatory reform. The amount of money you pay lawyers and others in regulatory reform, we think there's a way to work it out. And we need an aggressive export strategy, obviously. But yet today's political environment almost demands that we focus on the next election. I read polls today about the year 2000. Who's ahead? Well, Al Gore's ahead on the Democratic side and Cole and Powell on the Republican side. No big surprise. I'm not certain they'll both run. I'm certain probably one will run. But we're already polling for the year 2000. So I would just conclude by saying uh, sometimes it's either easier to do nothing. And we're not much different. I'm no longer a member of Congress, but I can tell you that sometimes it's easier to do nothing. Put it off another year. There's no real crisis. Wait another year for Medicare. Then you'll be down to a couple of years when you have to act. But the problem arises when their principal inertia we have a lot of is reinforced by cynical spin doctors and selfish lobbyists and journalists who favor public controversy over public education and zealots, yes, zealots on the left and the right who confuse running for office with conducting a holy war. We're not puppets on a string, politicians dancing to the music of the spinmeisters. Heretical as it may sound, I believe that most voters want authenticity more than they want ideological purity. They respect those with whom they disagree. Witness the appeal of Ronald Reagan, for example, as long as their disagreements are honest. So it seems to me that we have opportunity, we have some challenges, and you have some challenges. There's a great tradition, and I'll close and take questions, that the retiring presidents passing on some final words of wisdom before they leave the White House. Well, since I won't have that opportunity, I intend to spend some time in coming years repeating the words spoken in the final White House address by my hero, Dwight Eisenhower. And I want to leave you today with those words. And I quote, as we peer into society's future, we, you and I, and our government must avoid the impulse to live only for today, plundering for our own case convenience, the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss of their political and spiritual heritage. We want democracy to survive for all generations to come, not to become the insolvent phantom of tomorrow. Thank you very much. to have the Hausers join us. You were introduced in absentia. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Let me remind you that a question is short to the point and ends with a question mark. One speech a day. Uh, there are two mics on the floor, two in the balcony. And please introduce yourself to Senator Dole. 
Thank you very much. My name is Avery Gardner, and I'm a senior at Harvard College. And I wanted to ask you uh, about a particular moment in the campaign that surprised me, and that was your decision to leave the Senate and focus uh, fully on the election itself. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you feel about that decision now, uh, that everything's over, how it felt then and how it felt now, if you would, please. Well, I felt good then and I feel good now. I do watch C-SPAN a little to see what, what the uh, Senate's doing. They've all put on a little weight. They don't work as hard as they did when I was there. <laughs> But it, I, I had a, this feeling in my bones, maybe it wasn't valid, maybe people didn't care about it, but it seemed to me that there's a lot of cynicism, probably a lot in this audience, because they never think of us giving up anything. Politicians want more power. We don't want to give up any. That's, that's a non-starter. And I wanted to make a statement to the voters in the United States, whether Democrats, Republicans, or whatever, that I was going to give up something, not only my leadership, but my Senate seat. And I loved the Senate, and I thought about it for a long time, and I talked to my wife about it, and, and then after talking to her, I talked about it, thought about it a long time again, but I believe I made the right decision. I mean, it seemed to me that at least the people who were going to support me would know that I'm not one of the not out there making all these promises, but I always had a fallback. I could always come back to the Senate. So I, I think I made the right decision. I miss my colleagues in the Senate, as I know Senator Simpson does, and Mickey Edwards, and Peter Torkelson in the House, but I, made, I think I made the right. And there is a time to go. There's a time to go. When, you, when you're a candidate for President of the United States, it seems to me that you know, that's about as high as you can go. And I, that would also part of my thinking to go back to the Senate. It seemed to me that better that I move on. So now I've joined a, a law firm. I'm not going to practice law or lobby. And as soon as they tell me what I can do, <laughs> I'm going to report for work. And I'm with all these Democrats. I mean, Senate, my colleague, Senator Mitchell, Senator Benson, Governor Richards, Governor Blanchard, Governor Hawaii from Hawaii. And uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, Senator Dole, my name is Kyle Kimball. I am a first-year graduate student at the college, and I'm actually, I hail from Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and I had the pleasure of meeting you when I was 15 years old. I was governor of Boy State. And at that time, you pulled us aside, the, the lieutenant governor and I, and you said to never let our ambition come at the expense of others. And I was wondering, um, with respect to gay rights, with respect to employee discrimination within the workplace against gays and lesbians, um, with respect to issues of same-gender marriages, do you feel that in your career you did enough um, to maintain your ambition in light of what you felt might be an equal rights claim for gays and lesbians? Uh, I, I did what I thought I should do. Maybe it wouldn't be enough for some, but it seemed to me that we had no dis discrimination. We had a policy of non We didn't ask anybody any question about their lifestyle. Uh, I oppose same-sex marriages. That does not satisfy everyone, but uh, we had an open office as far as I was concerned, we did quite well. On the balcony on the left side. Uh, thank you. My name is Rachel Seymour. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. Senator Dole, uh, it's not surprising that here at the School of Government there are a number of students who would like to run for public office one day. Where is she? I'd like to know. Oh, up yeah. here. Up, yeah. <laughs> the voice from above, that's all right. I need to know. <laughs> I don't want to get into that either. <laughs> Of, now, this now is unfortunate. Uh, what kind of personal characteristics do you think uh, someone running for public office should have uh, in order to enter, uh, survive, and eventually, hopefully, succeed in public office? Well, I don't believe it's any great secret. I mean, you have to have some ambition, of course. I've never thought ambition was a bad thing. You can't be too ambitious or too solicitous. You need to have a pretty good understanding of if you're going to run for the Congress. If, who you might represent, some feel for the people there, the real people. Not those that show up at the big dinners, but maybe the real people out there who don't go to political meetings in either party. And you gotta like people. I mean, if you don't like people, you know, take up some other line of work, undertaker, whatever, but don't, <laughs> you know. But 
And I don't want to offend any undertakers. But, <laughs> but you've got to be able, and to listen, as I said earlier in my remarks. There's no magic about it. I mean, it seems to me there are many, many opportunities. I, we have an extensive intern program, as many others do in Washington. I'm sure they have state government. And I look back now, many of these young people who've been in our office as interns are now serving in the state legislature. And they had no idea about getting involved in politics until they had a little taste of it. So I would suggest to all of you here, Republicans or Democrats, that's one good place to learn. Get a hold of your congressman or your senator or both and serve an internship for six weeks or eight weeks or maybe all summer if you're lucky. Thank you. Right side of the bell. I mean, I'll give you, a, a, without elaborating, I got into politics because we had a law librarian, happened to be a Democrat, Beth Bowers, who tried to get young people involved in politics, and she didn't have any magic recipe, and she got two Democrats and two Republicans, and three of us ended up getting elected. And that was our first touch with politics. My parents were not active in politics. That's, that's the way it's up. Oh, the right oh excuse me. Senator Dole, my name is Russell Cayetos. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. And I have a question for you regarding your wife. If your wife decided to run for president, what is the most important piece of advice that you'd give to her? And what would you, would you urge her to do differently during her campaign that you didn't do or maybe did too much during your campaign? Well, I'd encourage her to win, of course, but. <laughs> uh, you know Elizabeth, and some do here, she's, I, I think you, she learned it at Harvard. I call it the Harvard discipline. She is a very disciplined person. She never does anything without being 100% prepared, which I think is great. Uh, I've never learned that. I generally prepare afterwards. But <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, she's had a lot of experience. Uh, she's helped me in campaigns in the past. She's taken a leave of absence from various jobs to help me in the past. She's, left the Red Cross for a year to help me in the election, did, an, I thought, an outstanding job. She's shaken up the whole way you're going to speak now at conventions from now on. She was walking out in the audience, which I think was a, you know, less formal and had more appeal and sort of closer to the people. But again, I, I think the advice I would give to anyone, I mean, you've got to be honest with yourself. You've got to be able to go to bed at night and sleep. And that doesn't mean you can agree with everybody on every issue. And I know it's difficult to have to disagree with someone. It's easier to say yes, if you're for it, I'm for it. So, I, and I, I don't think she'll have any difficulty with that, but she has the energy, she has certainly the intelligence and the knowledge, and uh, having served as Secretary of Labor and Secretary of Transportation, a member of the Federal Trade Commission and the White House Liaison Office, my view is she would be, she'd have the qualifications. But whether or not she runs would be a decision that that you know, she'll have to make, and I don't. I think it's a little early, frankly. My name is C.J. Mahoney. I'm a freshman at the college, and as you know, Senator, we share the same hometown of Russell, Kansas. That's right. And um, my question had to do with uh, what you said about bringing people together. It would appear in the Congress now that the exact opposite is happening, with the atmosphere becoming much more mean-spirited. Do you believe that Congress became less cordial during your tenure there, and how do you believe that will affect legislation and the way Congress works in the future? Well, I think it's changed some over the years, just my own view. It may not be the view of everybody who's served in Congress here, but when I first came to Congress, uh, as a freshman, you were hardly tolerated. I mean, you were there, but you didn't bother anybody. And you certainly didn't get up and make a speech saying that you knew anything. <laughs> in fact, I think it was my second or third year, as I said, we had Speaker McCormack at the time, who I don't think ever knew who I was, but he's a very nice man, because I'd only been there four or five years, you know, and he had other people to meet, so, and listen to. But it's changed. I think it changed. I know there's a big change when you go from the House to the Senate. Even when I went to the Senate in 1968, it's a long time ago, uh, I became very active. I was called Nixon's Sheriff of the Senate, because all the senior members were busy doing things worthwhile, and I didn't have anything to do. I was a freshman. So I sort of rode shotgun on the Senate floor. And we had a lot of debates on judgeships and the Vietnam War. 
And in fact, I attended an event last week with Senator McGovern celebrating his 75th birthday, and we talked about some of the things we did together and some of the things we didn't agree on. So I, yes, there's been a change. We had the advent of television. We have C-SPAN. I don't think it's changed it that much. Changed that much, but I think there is more confrontation. I think, particularly in the Senate, when we're in the minority, you know, we can use the rules to tie up the Senate. And Tom Daschle has certainly learned that he can use the rules on the Democratic side to tie up the Senate. So even though you have a majority of 55 to 45. It's almost gotten to the point now in the United States Senate, if you're going to accomplish a great deal, you're going to have to have 60. 60 Democrats or 60 Republicans, and they'll all have to stick together, which isn't easy to do either. But uh, it does tend to lead to bipartisanship from time to time. But I think there's a lot of power vested in the minority that just suddenly, or not suddenly, but over the past few years has been recognized. It's called gridlock. You can call it anything you want, but it's not very much progress. Hi, my name is Allison Ford, and I'm a freshman at the college. I hope you'll <coughs> forgive me for asking a question that's very similar to one that was previously asked, but I'd like <coughs> to hear you expand upon it a little more. Um, you mentioned several times in your speech about inclusion and about how you didn't believe that a, you voted for civil rights because you didn't believe that a first-class nation can make any of its citizens second class. And so I was wondering how you and how the Republican Party, which in your own words supports the sanctity of the individual and uh, liberty of conscience, can continue to purport to have the government intrude upon certain individuals and not allow um, equality and freedom of rights, the same equal rights, to certain individuals such as fair housing um, and marriage um, to individuals who are gays or lesbians? Well, again, I, you know, I, I think I've got a fairly good position, but I don't go quite that far. Now, maybe 10, 15 years or less, it will happen. But uh, I, I just, I'm opposed to same-sex marriages. I'm opposed to benefits for couples of the same sex, and that's a view I have. I mean, I'm, I can't please everyone. Now, maybe uh, there are enough in the Congress and not enough now, but maybe there'll be enough in the President Clinton, in fact, signed the bill opposing same-sex marriages. So it's not a partisan thing. I hope the Republican Party, in fact, I made a big mistake in the camp, or made a mistake. I don't think it was that big. It was played up as a big mistake. We had a contribution of, I think, $2,000 from the log cabin Republicans, and we didn't accept it. In hindsight, we should have taken it and said precisely what Ronald Reagan is. If they agree with our agenda, fine, period, end of case. But it went back and forth and back and forth and became a news item. So I hope that I'm tolerant. Balcony on the left. Hi, Senator Dahl. My name is Alex Rodriguez. Um, I'm from Arizona and will be graduating soon from the Kennedy School. Um, by the way, uh, I'm sure you're as proud of, as proud of um, the Arizona Wildcats, your alma mater, my <coughs> alma mater, for winning the championship. Right. Um, my question uh, regards the, the campaign. Uh, I'm curious to know, from your point of view, why it is that you lost the state of Arizona and other, quote, Republican uh, havens. Well, again, I'd have to defer to some who took a lot of service. I think primarily, in, in my own view, is Florida and Arizona was Medicare. I mean, millions of dollars spent on Medicare ads, which strongly suggest that if Bob Dole is elected, you're going to be taken off the rolls. That has an impact not just on the beneficiaries, but as I said earlier, the children and others who might have to pick up the tab. Now, is that fair? Uh, I assume it's fair to make those chart facts I talked about in a general way. And I'm not suggesting it all came from one side. But, uh, but I look at it, states like Arizona, and I've looked at some of the areas in Florida where we lost three to one, where it should have been at least 50-50. It's pretty clear that, that that was a big, big issue. Senator Dole, my name is John Meary. I'm a junior at Harvard. Um, I have a question for you. By the time someone is a senator or a congressman, I imagine they've pretty much solidified what their beliefs are and what they think on certain issues. But many of the people that are here listening to you today are still forming our opinions. Sure. And we don't have the benefit, um, many of us, that you have of years of experience. So if you could pick out something, one piece of advice that you think about as you fall asleep at night, one thing that you wish 
our generation would understand or know. What would that be? Well, let, let me give you an example, because I don't think that's true. I mean, I hope that those of us who are elected to Congress in, in either party or whatever gender, you know, can change our minds, that we have some flexibility. I'll give you an example. And let me tell you, uh, again, it's with George McGovern. We were both on the Agriculture Committee, both from farm states, South Dakota, Kansas. And McGovern started these field hearings on hunger in America, which I thought at the out said with nothing but a you know, political ploy to get him ready to run for president. But I was on the committee, and I traveled with McGovern, and it, be, it occurred to me in about the second stop that whatever his motives were, this was something that was very worthwhile. So I may have had a different view on Monday, but by the following Monday, having examined and listened to some of the people and, and actually seen some of the conditions in South Carolina and Florida and other states, I changed my mind and worked with my gut. In fact, we eliminated the purchase requirement for food stamps, which many people thought was a big, big mistake. But it occurred to us that if you don't have any money at all, how are you going to put down the first dollar or five dollars or whatever it is? And that doesn't mean you shouldn't watch fraud and abuse, and there's a lot of it going on in that program. So I've never adopted or never held the view that uh, once I've decided that it's always going to be the same, I don't suggest you ought to change your mind every 10 minutes in politics. But there are, you know, events will happen. Uh, you can change your mind on foreign policy very quickly if some event happens and you decide that you've been wrong. And the same is true in many domestic areas, whether it's expanding Medicare or whether it's a, affirmative action. And I know some may disagree with me on affirmative action. I, I agree to take affirmative action. I mean, Tiger Woods didn't get to where he got with affirmative action programs. He got there with a lot of hard work. And I believe in affirmative action for those who are economically disadvantaged. Economically disadvantaged. Regardless of race or gender, we need affirmative action for low-income Americans. And I think beyond that, we ought to take a tough, tough look at it. But so, you know, we can change our minds. Some people do it daily. Uh, I don't recommend that. But uh, <clears throat> let, let me just conclude by saying that uh, You know, I, I'm not certain what anybody learns from someone who's been around in politics, but when I started in the House, I think I was 36 years of age. And I served eight years there and 20-some years in the Senate. And I must say that almost every day was a learning experience. When I first came to Congress, I probably could have been referred to as a right-wing Republican. I mean, I didn't see any daylight between the far right and anything else. But again, if you keep your eyes open and don't talk a lot and listen, you understand that the problems we may have had in northwest Kansas or problems we didn't have in northwest Kansas, they might have had in Boston or New York City or somewhere else. I remember when they were saying that New York City was going into bankruptcy and Senator Javits was pleading with us conservative Republicans said, I don't care how you vote on final passage, you got to vote with me on cloture. That's often the big vote. If you get 60 votes, it's going to pass easily. And I'd attended Brooklyn College for a while, so I felt some, some little touch there about New York. And I voted with Senator Javits, even though it wasn't a very popular vote in the Midwest. So I would just say, whether it's Bob Dole or whether it be George Mitchell here, I think we could all cite examples where we may have had a change of, of heart. But I can't think of many times when I went to work that I wasn't excited about it. <clears throat> when you drive up the Capitol, particularly at night, and the dome is lighted, or when you walk into the chamber and your colleagues are there on both sides of the aisle, or the President of the United States comes to a joint session regardless of his party, it's exciting. And that's what I think America's all about. You know, I, I said a lot in the campaign, we're one America. We're not hyphenated this or hyphenated that. We're Americans. And we're proud to be Americans, whether we're born here, naturalized, or whatever. And none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes, not just in campaigns, but just make mistakes. We're human. And sometimes I think we, people don't think we're human, but we are. 
So I would just say to everyone in this audience that uh, I hope you become active in politics. Obviously, I have a preference. But just being active in politics, you're going to learn a lot about America and a lot about yourselves that you probably hadn't reflected on for a time. So again, appreciate very much this opportunity, Albert. I thank all of you for being here, and God bless America. Thank you.